Cool. A very warm welcome to everybody present uh, on behalf of the board of ADHD Europe. It's fantastic that we have this opportunity to pick up a really interesting subject like ADHD relations, sex and intimacy. A special welcome to Ari Tuckman, who will introduce himself in a minute. And uh, let me start with introducing myself for those who don't know me. I'm Hans van der Velde from Rotterdam in Holland. I'm board member of ADHD Europe. I work in daily life, I work as a coach. I coach employees with special brains for employers. And besides that, I myself have dyslexia and ADHD. Uh, that's enough about me because the whole story will be about Ari today. Uh, Anna Maria, can you please mm -hmm. introduce yourself? My sidekick, Anna Maria. Okay, uh, I'm Anna Maria, uh, come from Croatia, Zagreb. I work with uh, children and adults with uh, different neurodiversities like ADHD, dyslexia, uh, autism specter, and I'm very happy to be here. Um, Ali Tuckman, we are very happy to have you in our webinar with a very important subject. Um, I, I have been reading your article Between the Sheets, mm -hmm. and you've, you have also written a book, uh, ADHD After Dark, ADHD Between the Sheets, ADHD After Dark, and I've been thumping through it, and I, you mentioned one hand a lot of problems related to ADHD relations and specifically sex and uh, you also mentioned some tips solutions etc can you as a startup mention some common problems related to ADHD and sexuality please? sure so you know when I started out in you know, I've been doing ADHD stuff for about 20 years now. And, you know, initially a lot of my work was focused on sort of practical matters of life, you know, helping kids, teens, and adults be more effective, stay on top of things, get stuff done. You know, like it's all that stuff. It's all important. I mean, it is. But I've become more and more interested in how ADHD impacts a couple's relationship and sex life. You know, I began to see more and more of that in my office. And it so I wanted to write a book on how, how that is. And, you know, particularly not just relationships in general, but also about um, how it impacts a couple's sex life. Because couples who already struggle too much by day can benefit all the more from that good, positive connection that comes from good sexual experiences at night. And this is especially true for couples who've been, been together a while when sexuality often drops off. And, you know, I think that if you feel connected well sexually, if you feel like you're on the same team sexually, I think it's a lot easier to then deal with the normal stuff of life, all the, the struggles and the stresses and the things that make us all crazy over the course of our day. Um, I, I was saying that ADHD doesn't invent new problems it just exacerbates the universal problems. So how do two people, you know, if we assume one person has ADHD, one person doesn't, how do two people who want different things, have different needs, have different ways of being, negotiate a way to make them both happy in the relationship? And if your relationship is struggling, probably your sex life will struggle as well. If your sex life is struggling, probably your relationship will struggle as well. So, so we've been missing this important point of intervention, you know, that helping these couples have a better sex life is going to benefit their relationship overall. So, um, you know, so a lot of the ways that ADHD impacts a couple's sex life actually doesn't have anything to do with the sex part of it. It has to do with the relationship part of it that affects how a couple gets around to the sexuality part. There are yeah. some impacts on sex, which we'll talk about as well, but for now, let's just kind of, you know, we can talk about the relationship impact. Yeah, so uh, uh, specifically, uh, good that you mentioned that. Uh, I said I, I received some questions in advance, and it appeared to me that hmm, these are more general sexuality relations problems. And like you say, uh, ADHD works like a magnifying glass it makes problems bigger. Yeah. And, but are there any examples of really specific, more ADHD related problems? Yeah. So, 
So, you know, when I, in the research that I did, in the survey I did, looking at, you know, how ADHD impacts a couple's sex life, um, I asked people what were the biggest barriers to a better sex life? Um, because, you know, I figured that's important. Let's figure out what gets in the way and then we know what to do better. Um, the good news is the five least, the five smallest barriers to a better sex life all had to do with the sex itself. So generally speaking, once people actually got around to it, it's usually a pretty good experience for the most part. You know, that wasn't the, what's that? <laughs> creative. Is it yeah. actually creative in bed? Come on. Yeah, and that could certainly be. Um, yeah. I did find that folks with ADHD wanted a little bit more novelty in their sex, in their sex life, and that's definitely important in a long-term relationship. So definitely that's a piece of it. Um, yeah. But, you know, what I found to be the biggest barriers in, for these couples was either not enough time or energy for sex or not enough good feelings for sex. And, you know, we know that ADHD impacts time management. We know that it impacts a person's ability to kind of get stuff done in an efficient way. Um, you know, so, so tasks that should have been done earlier get procrastinated to later. And then it's just sort of too late and people aren't like they're tired, you know, or they stay up too late and then they don't have, want to have sex in the morning because they're too tired or they don't have time for it or whatever. So, you know, so some of this is about time management problems that then spill over into lack of sex problems. Um, sometimes it's about the bad feelings that, you know, especially if one person if feels like, well, I'll just say it this way. If the non-ADHD partner feels like they're taking up too much of the work, I'm doing too much, I can't count on you, I'm resentful, they don't want to be sexual with their partner. And probably the person with ADHD who's always being criticized okay. and yelled <laughs> at and feels their partner's anger, they probably don't want to have sex either because like that's not sexy either. So, um, you know, so these are the couples who really struggle where, again, it's not a sex problem at that point, it's a relationship, negotiating, getting things done, picking our battles kind of a problem. Okay. So yeah. sometimes the sec to resolve the sex problems, we need to address the relationship problems. Uh, that, that's, uh, I, let me tell you about two cases that came in, two questions. And the first one was a 63 year old woman in a long marriage, very loving relation, no problems as what she write. But she, uh, she writes, I don't ne really need sex. I have to persuade myself to do it. So that's in fact something to do with uh, losing sex drive during your mm -hmm. lifetime. Then I thought, well, okay, it might be a women thing, an, an age thing, and something with losing sex drive during life. But then the mm -hmm. next question came in, a 32-year-old man, very busy with work, uh, next to his work does a study, and during the last 10 years or some, he lost interest in people, in social relations, and in sex. So right. how do you see this relation? And is there an ADHD part in it? Because we're talking about ADHD today, and, right. uh, because the whole uh, sexuality would be too broad for today. What's the relation with ADHD, losing sex drive, uh, Again, the magnifying glass, or is there something mm -hmm. else? You know, so I think that these two examples are very different from each other, my guess, in terms of what's going on. So, you know, for the older woman who's been in a relationship for a long time, the relationship is good, but the sex is fizzling out. Okay, some of this may just be kind of biological, hormonal changes. She's less interested in sex. Um, you know, maybe some of it, I, is she, does she have ADHD or her partner? She has ADHD. Okay, so, um, you know, so some of it may also be that she's kind of distracted by other things and sex doesn't come up, it doesn't come into her mind as often. But the question that I would ask her is, once you do start a sexual encounter, do you enjoy it? Is it good? Because there are those who have what's called more of a responsive sexual desire, meaning if you just leave them alone, they don't necessarily get that idea of like, ooh, I could have some sex right now. But if they start, then it's great. And they're like, man, why don't we do this more often? Um, so 
if that is the case for her, then maybe it's, it becomes a matter of sort of reminding herself, sex is important, I do enjoy it, and after we're, you know, in the middle of it, I'm very happy to be doing it. And afterwards, I'm glad that we did it. So I just need to kind of do it a little bit more. Um, on the other hand, if it's a thing where she doesn't really enjoy it that much, then I guess I would wonder why that is. You know, is there something about their sex life? Is there something about the expectations they have? Um, are they just doing the same old things? Maybe they need to add some more variety into what they're doing. Um, you know, it takes effort over the decades to make sex still interesting, just like it takes effort to make the rest of the relationship still yeah. interesting. So, you know, just sort of really kind of think about what would make kind of the, you know, the saying is what would make sex worth wanting? Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. you know, now for the, for the second person, you know, the guy who, you know, is 32, still pretty young, becoming less interested in sex, but also sounds like people, you know, I would wonder in his case, is this about stress? Is this about depression? Um, you know, is this about self-esteem? I would wonder what else is going on because certainly all of those can have an impact. And you know, if he's working and going to school and has ADHD, although even without it, it's still going to be a challenge. You know, is this a thing where he's just so overwhelmed that sex is just like it, it's the first thing to go? Yeah. Um, so, so, so to summarize, uh, don't always put it on your ADHD. Look at your relationship. Okay, possibly via your GP, ask for some psychologist to help you and to really talk about it. And uh, uh, look at other factors like stress, anxiety, depression, etc. That may be the case. Um, yeah, I mean, sex is complicated. You know, everything in your life will affect your sex life potentially. Everything in your relationship will affect your sex life potentially. There's no one answer. So depending on the situation, depending on the person, there, you know, there's a lot of potential answers, but it's often more than one answer even for one person. It's not just yeah. one thing, typically. No. And, and the, the, then the, the bridge from tiredness and not, not losing your sex drive when you're tired. Here was a person really asking about an ADSD aspect, like being overstimulated, too much stimuli during the day, mm -hmm. and uh, experiencing physical influence uh, let's say about touching the genitals the clitoris etc and uh, that if there were, were too much stimuli during the day then it it wouldn't feel okay to be touched hmm. to uh, let's say go away i don't want any impulses yeah. anymore. that's uh, the question was quite a, a story mm -hmm. but, uh, do you recognize something in this typically for adhd that at the end of the day, you want to stop all the stimuli, including sex and touching and whatever. I mean, there are some people where that is true, you know, that they just sort of, they get overwhelmed, overburned, you know, yeah. just burned out during the day. And yeah. if that's the case, I guess on the one hand, my first thought is just, just know that about yourself. You know, like, this is just how I am. Um, and it's hardly unique. I mean, there's lots of people where at the end of a long day, they just, they don't have it in them um, <clears throat> to want to have sex. But it may also be a situation of, you know, okay, so what do I need to do to put a little bit more space between my stressful day and a sexual encounter? So maybe that means a little bit of time to just watch some easy TV show. Maybe it means going to the gym or taking a walk. Maybe it means, you know, some soft music and we just kind of lie there and, and talk about whatever for a little while so I can sort of, you know, de-stress and calm down and sort of come back into my body. You know, so some of it, maybe those are some things that are potentially helpful, but I think to, that it's probably from a relationship perspective important to talk to your partner about it because I could see this being a situation where the partner takes it personally. You're not interested in me. I'm not attractive enough. I'm not good enough at sex. You don't like me. Um, like it's easy to read our insecurities into something like that. So to educate your partner, like this is how I am. It has nothing to do about you. Don't take it personally. And here are some ways to approach me. Like here's how to approach me in a way that's going to get a good response. Here are some ways that maybe won't get as good of a response. So this is again ADHD as the magnifying glass. During the day, you get too much stimuli, you work too hard, too long, don't know when to stop in time, 
and don't have a good time management to pause and look at a silly television show to be prepared and be more open for a second. Yeah. yeah, okay. And and you know, we may we may kind of go the other way with this that you know, maybe the hope of I would like to you know, spend some time with my partner, have a good sexual encounter, or just a good encounter in general. Um, maybe that is the motivator. So at 10 a.m. in the morning, I hold that in mind and say, you know what? I want to be done with things. I want to be free and clear by nine tonight. So to be done by nine, I, I got to work on this now. Like now, now is the time mm. that will determine what happens 10 hours from now. So, um, you know, I'm not saying it's, it's that easy, but, but there is something to that, to remember that what happens at night is influenced by what happened in the morning and what happens in the afternoon. Yeah. And, you know, that, that there is this sort of end point to the night, that if the goal is to be in bed together at nine, some things have to happen now. Okay. Yeah. And, and again, I'm, I'm trying to manipulate you into the typical... ADHD thing because mm -hmm. I know I know a lot of people with ADHD and myself including etc what is the ADHD thing in but then we if we know this is the ADHD part of it you can take measurements and get a coach or whatever and, yeah. and then you can develop um, a, a new question came in uh, how to deal with hypersexuality then with the hyper oh that's a good question yeah that's yeah. a good question because also for the single ones sorry hans but uh, yeah, yeah. not only for the couples also for you know ADHD, adhd brains who are not in the relationships yeah and right. from hypersexuality you get to sexual addiction etc so is what's the adhd thing in that so you know this was a thing that i didn't predict it in my survey research but I'm also not surprised. Um, so one of the fi findings that I had is when I looked at, at my survey questions and I looked at the questions that had something to do with sexual eagerness. Um, so these are things like um, desired sexual frequency, masturbation frequency, porn use frequency, how people feel about their own porn use, how do they feel about their partner's porn use, how kinky they feel they are, um, other things like that. There are, about, there are 12 questions. Those with ADHD rated themselves higher on 10 out of 12, and they tied on the other two. So the non-ADHD partners didn't rate themselves higher on one of the 12. Um, so I think that what it tells us, and this fits into a broader theory of ADHD, is that Folks with ADHD are more influenced by sexual stimuli around them and sexual thoughts and ideas from within their own head, just as folks with ADHD are more influenced by other stimuli around them. Okay. You know, yeah. so other distractions, other things going on, other thoughts and desires from within their own mind. So, um, so this then applies also to sexuality, but the... So what it meant was that the guys with ADHD had higher sexual eagerness than the guys without. The women with ADHD had higher sexual eagerness than the women without. Um, so, so it does mean then that, you know, there are some folks with ADHD who really are just, they're much more sexually eager, which means that yeah. they're, you know, they want more sex, maybe more intense sex, maybe more varied sex with the people that they're with, whether a long-term partner or just a hookup. Um, but, you know, also more kind of solo sexual experiences. This is neither good nor bad. It just, it is what it is. You know, what yeah. makes it good or bad is what do you do with it, like anything in life. Um, so, you know, there are those folks who run into problematic sexual behavior. I don't, I don't buy into the idea that sex is addictive. Um, I think people make terrible choices about sex. I think pe some people behave really badly with sex, but that doesn't mean sex is addictive. It just means people have the ability to make terrible choices. Um, so, you know, but if you're someone with a very high sex drive and you have a partner who has a much lower sex drive, that is a setup for trouble. And mm -hmm. especially in the couples where the guy has ADHD, the woman doesn't, 
if the guy's ADHD is not very well managed and she feels angry and resentful, like we're talking about straight couples here. Um, but I think some of this would apply to same sex couples too. But you know, if, if the partner feels angry and resentful and tired and just not in the mood as a result of that, it can create a situation where the guy feels like he's always, you know, has to chase his female partner for sex. The, the female partner always feels like she's being chased. Neither one of them is happy. And it's a setup potentially for him to go seek, um, you know, sexual contact with other people or to look at a lot of porn or to masturbate a lot, um, you know, which is potentially problematic in the relationship if they haven't yeah, figured yeah. out what is okay and what isn't. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, okay, yeah. Right, so that's, uh, and, and are there any solutions if, if uh, okay, maybe from your ADHD with yeah. a bit more fantasy, a bit more associative brain, you, you, you end up more frequently in uh, wanting sex. Yeah. Be it alone, so, be it with a partner. Are there any solutions to, to stabilize it in your relationship when you get into troubles with your partner, be it a man or a woman, never mind? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think the, you know, the solutions involve things like if poorly managed ADHD or poorly managed anxiety or depression or substance use, you know, if other things in either partner are having a negative effect on the relationship and a negative effect on your sex life, those are pretty important things to work on. Yeah. And, you know, like... I'm not saying that should be your only motivator, but if that is important to you, let that be a motivator. Use that as a reason to do the good work in other ways. Um, so that's part of it. I think part of it also is to create an atmosphere of generosity and to maybe have some direct discussions. You know, I would like to have more sex with you. How, how do we make that happen? Um, yeah. And maybe sometimes more sex means I'm not up for intercourse and I'm just, no thanks. I'm just not that interested, but maybe there's something else I can do for you. Or maybe I'll lie here while you just take care of yourself. Maybe that's the shared sexual encounter yeah. or let's, let's talk about masturbation. Where does it fit? Let's talk our... about masturbation. Yeah. 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 And you know, for most people masturbate at least sometimes and you know, it can be again, both good or bad. If it's a thing of, I'm not, interested please take care of yourself we're both going to be happier if you do yeah. then that's a really good thing um yeah, sure. and Thanks. let's talk about porn is that okay you know like i don't care whether you do or don't look at porn i just hope that two both members of the couple are honest and it doesn't become like a secret thing because then yeah. that becomes a problem yeah um and what about masturbating in front of your partner yeah that so maybe the partner you know gets aroused during the process or wants to yeah. start to participate or something yeah or or maybe they don't i mean no, so or maybe of course not. right so yeah. but but i think that you're on to something which is you know sex prob like i'm not going to say it shouldn't be but probably most couples are better off if sex is not only one thing mm -hmm. in that sometimes a really awesome sexual encounter involves something like that, like masturbating in front of each other. Or maybe, you know, one person masturbates and the other person just kind of lies there and maybe they're dressed and maybe they're undressed and maybe they're, they're, you know, kissing their neck or touching their chest or something. Or maybe they're not, you know, maybe they're just kind of there, but they're not that much involved in it, but that's okay. Um, sure, at least you know, they so, share the, the, the intimacy. In that way, they also share the intimacy. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So rather, you know, so the generosity is on both people for the less interested partner to say, you know what, I'm not really interested, but, but I will do this for you. Yeah. I will, you know, be involved in this way, um, in this partial way. Um, but then for the person who wants the sex more to not feel angry that they got less than what they wanted and instead to be happy that they got more than they could have. You know, I wish you were, I wish we were doing the full production, but still it's nice to have you here for yeah. whatever part of it it is that you sure. do. Sure, it's nice to share that part with you, even if you don't feel the same at the moment. It is. So, and, yeah. and there's something potentially very intimate about that. 
True, true. There are you know, like, couples even 10 years together and they've never masturbated uh, in front of each other. Yeah. So, yeah. And, you know, I couples I see where, you know, they've been together 20 years, 30 years, and neither of them has any idea about their partner's masturbation. Yeah. And on the one hand, I mean, there's no law that you have to, but on the other hand, it's just, it's interesting to me, like, this is kind of, I don't know, this is sort of an important thing. You don't know this thing about each other. Why is that? You know, sure, like farting. why is it so hard? What? Yeah. Like farting. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like By this the way, uh, uh, Ari, now that we have this little discussion, this reminds me that th this is about your job, the mm -hmm. professional job you do. Isn't it of the most Im great importance that when you have clients in a relation, one of the things you do, bring the words, really the words like masturbation, uh, mm -hmm. et cetera, literally on the table that you, I as a coach experienced that also, that I bring it on the table and show them you just can talk about it because this little chat between Anna Maria and you, this was quite explicit. And I know a lot of couples who don't dare to be explicit. Right. Uh, so the first step is talk about it, name, really name what you want and yeah. go around it and be fuzzy because that will lead to misunderstanding. And I think that's one of, one of the jobs of a good sex therapist that's the one who's used to and just talks about it normally, nothing special. Yeah. And you, you're, you're not a disaster. You just can name what you want. Is that, do you recognize that in your, in your uh, consultation room? Absolutely. I mean, that is definitely true. Sometimes just having the, the comfort to talk about it yeah, is, sure. is half of the solution. Um, yeah. Because, you know, I mean, there are times I have couples where they're talking in such vague terms. I don't even know what they're saying. You know, yeah, like I, yeah. I could, I think I know what they're referring, but I don't, but I don't, I'm not sure I do. Yeah, so, right. um, you know, so if you can't talk in clear terms with each other, the odds of your partner doing the thing that's going to make you the most happy is a lot lower. Yeah. Um, and I think so that the, the, that is the oh, sorry, no, yeah, <laughs> yeah, so, with ADHD at work. Right. That is fine. So hold that thought for one sec. I'll throw this in and then you can throw that in. So, you know, I think that for couples who are struggling when one partner has ADHD or couples who are struggling for whatever the reason, like there's so much tension and bad feeling that it's, it's, it feels too dangerous to be vulnerable and honest this would really turn me on, or I really love it when you do this, or actually I don't really like it that much when you do that. You know, like it's hard to have that kind of direct honesty with each other. And, you know, their sex life kind of suffers for it. It's not as good as it could be, and it doesn't give them the benefits that they could get. So, you know, part of working on your ADHD and the rest of your relationship and your anxiety or whatever the other person has, um, is because it makes it easier to have these good conversations about your sex life as well. Yeah. I'm so yeah, what were you gonna say? Yeah, that those conversations are actually the field of intimacy. You know, that this is the part when, when the sex and intimacy should come together, no? Yeah. And that is also the part missing very often, like you said. It is, it is. Because the thing is, intimacy is not I'm going to tell you the things that I know you're going to feel good about and feel the same way and like. True. True. I mean, that's part of intimacy, but that's yeah. like first date intimacy. Mm. You know, it's like, yeah. oh, wait, you like pizza and movies also? Really? Wow. I, we're like the same person. I can't mm -hmm. believe we both like pizza. Um, and Netflix, come on. Right. And Netflix. Really? You, you, you also Netflix? subscribe to oh Netflix? Oh, my God. Man, that, <laughs> we are like two peas in a pod Soulmates. here. Soulmates. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, real intimacy is, is showing parts of yourself that your partner may not agree with, may not understand, may not feel good about. And, you know, I think that sometimes intimacy gets forced when, for example, somebody finds somebody else's porn browser history. Wait, you like what? What are you watching? You know, and you, it, it becomes this thing where it, it kind of makes the private public. You know, yeah. you can no longer say, wait, what? Um, 
I'm not, I, I, I wouldn't be interested in that. Who would be interested in that? Oh, not me. Yeah. And now it's like, wait, you just watched 10 videos of that. Um, yeah. you're, you're interested in that. In some way, this is a thing of interest to you. Now you can't deny it. And you know, that can be a really hard situation to deal with at that time. So I think it's better to have, ideally, some of these conversations earlier than that, to work up to it, to start with some smaller stuff, get that you know, out there, get some understanding, and then from there have more conversation, more conversation. But you know, if you're arguing and fighting about stupid things like who forgot to clean the kitchen and who didn't buy milk, like you never get to this harder stuff. Here again, a relation to ADHD. Yeah. Because uh, also from my own experience, I get a lot of uh, remembrance of you forgot to clean the kitchen, you forgot to put the, the the dirt outside, you forgot this and you forgot that, and then irritation starts. So here again, we're on ADHD, and yeah. what, what we are doing now, like uh, uh, mentioning uh, all the words explicitly, um, and if as a couple you learn how, as a young couple also, you learn how to be explicit about sex, then, this is the bridge to the next question, when you get children yourself and you have to tell, talk to them about sex and yeah. intimacy, how explicit you dare to be, what yeah. family culture do you have? Uh, there is a question about that uh, from a coach psychologist um, who uh, I think two different ones, I don't know. One says, how can I teach teenagers starting to be interested in sex mm -hmm. to say no when they really don't want it, not from some, yeah. some, uh, other, uh, some taboo or something, but if they don't want, say no. And uh, how to set their boundaries with peer group pressure because uh, yeah. during uh, adolescence and puberty, the peer group is very important. And right. I just asked, um, being an ADHD coach and working with children and teens with ADHD, I see a lot of sexual interest with teens, but often in a way that is not appropriate for their age. So I think uh, this, uh, Vanessa, means uh, too early, too young for it. And um, is that a thing in ADHD? So the puberty yeah. and ADHD sexual development. Can you tell something about that? I mean, there is some research that says that teenagers with ADHD have more sexual partners than those without. They also have more unplanned pregnancies. I think they also have more sexually transmitted infections because, yeah. you know, impulsivity and you know having sex without a condom and things like that um so you know i think it's important in general that you know when it comes to sexuality in kids that 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 sex is not a forbidden topic you know like if you don't talk about something you are saying something about it yeah we don't talk about sex equals sex is bad don't talk about it it does not sex we don't talk about sex is not a neutral statement like that is a very clear and strong statement. So, so I think to talk about it, um, which we should all be doing anyway, at age appropriate levels. So when you're six, it's a different conversation than when you're 12. Um, but uh, oh, ex Excuse me, a super interesting question came in, but please, uh, after you finish. Okay. The, the okay. last one, yeah, it's an excellent question. Okay, okay. good. Uh, all right. So, um, but, you know, especially for our kids who are more likely to be impulsive, I think that, you know, in general, they need more kind of supervision, they need more monitoring, more structure, more boundaries than kids who are less impulsive. And that includes not just, you know, misbehaving in the classroom, but also like drinking and smoking and having sex that they later will not be happy about. Um, you know, I think for some folks who get more, you know, some folks with ADHD who maybe get more criticism, they may be more prone to seek out sexual contact as a way to feel good about themselves yeah. or to be more willing to allow other people to initiate sexual contact with them because they feel like they need the social boost and that they can't say no or they don't know how to say no. 
or they don't see that they're in a situation that is going there and then get themselves out of it earlier. So, you know, I think for all of our teenagers, we should be talking about sex probably earlier than you think you should. Um, but especially... What age, what age do you start talking with the your teens? Sorry. I think... I think you, yeah, no, it is from birth. I think you start talking yeah. about sex early on. Like it's not, right. a, you don't wait till they're 13 and then start having the conversation. I um, agree. Right. Yeah, yeah. Well, and you're Dutch, so you guys do it, you do it the best. You well, do it way better than everybody okay. else. So okay. let's not talk about the Dutch. <laughs> right. Well, maybe it's because the Americans are so terrible at it, but yeah. that everybody's better than us. But, um, yeah. but I, yeah, I, I agree. Yeah. I would like to say no, but yeah. You had another yeah, question, Anna, Mar Anna yeah. Maria. You had a question, an urgent question coming. Uh, it was a very interesting question. So, uh, do you have any advice for people with ADHD who get distracted during sex? Yeah. And losing erection or problems with reaching an orgasm. Oh my God! I feel yeah. this person. You know, I really, I'm. I, I have all the sympathy on the world for this person because your mind just wanders away and. Yeah and you're in the middle of sex with a yeah. person who, for example, doesn't have ADHD. If a person, if your partner has ADHD, he or she will understand, but you know, it's difficult to explain it to a person without ADHD, no? Right. Well, I think, so first of all, everybody gets distracted sometimes during sex. Like that, that's the thing that happens. It is true. I have data on this. Folks with ADHD get distracted more than folks without. Um, women get distracted more than men. And women with ADHD get distracted more than women without ADHD. Um, so even during a sexual encounter. So I think, first of all, if you're the partner, do not take it personally. Don't get defensive. Don't get angry. This is not a comment on your skills or attractiveness or anything like that. Unless your partner actually says, this sex is boring. That's why I'm distracted. Unless they say that, don't think it. Um, so... If you find your partner getting distracted, just bring them back. Just say like, hey, here we go, or let's switch positions, or I'm not, or use your words and say, oh, now I'm going to do this to you. So some way to like bring them back to the moment. But I think also, um, you know, like here's just one example. I have a couple where in this case, the guy has ADHD, but for the woman, if the bedroom was a mess, if his stuff was all over the bedroom, she found it really distracting. Like for her, that made sex harder, made it harder to get into the mood for sex, but also during sex, it was more distracting. So if there are certain kinds of things that are more distracting to you, if you can address them first. Now, having said that, if you wait for your life to be perfect before having sex or doing anything, like you'll never have sex because your life is never that perfect. Um, so some of it is in, I think, something of a mindful way to sort of let those distractions go and bring yourself back into the moment. There is, there's a woman named Lori Brotto, B-R-O-T-T-O, -T -T a Canadian sex researcher, psychologist, who's written a book on mindfulness, um, particularly for women with low sexual desire. So, you know, certainly mindfulness in general, I think can be helpful, maybe before sex to sort of pause and get yourself into that frame of mind, maybe a little bit during, um, but also, maybe a little bit of medication is helpful. Now, generally, overall, um, this was one of those things I would have bet money. Before I did my survey, I would have bet money that medication, that folks with ADHD do better during sex when their medication is working compared to when it isn't. Yeah. Like, I literally would have bet money on that because that was yeah. the advice that we but were it, giving. It wasn't the true, no? It, it wasn't wa the true. On average, no. on average, it wasn't no. true. I mean, there no, are some people, there are some people where, yes, it does help. And if you are one of those no, people, then do course. it. Of course, yeah, of course. But, yeah. but overall, most people didn't actually find no. it that helpful. So, so, like, that's cool. Like, this is why you do research yeah. because it proves yeah. you wrong in the places that you're making yeah. assumptions. So. Thank you for bringing that up because yeah. uh, one would expect, uh, it was one of the questions that came in, uh, may medication help or may medication work negative? Mm -hmm. And it, it, for some it helps, but certainly not for everybody, not statistically significant. And uh, work negative, 
that yeah. lust gets less with medication. Yeah. For some. Yeah. For some. For some. Okay. Um, then uh, before we go on, for all participants, I repeat that if you have a question, please put it in the Q&A and not in the chat. The chat is too much all over the place. Um, I will uh, save all the questions and we will look at it if all questions are answered. And you can also email questions via email to me, then I will pass them on to Ari Tuchman. So let's go on for uh, next question. Uh, I have yes, one uh, I? Uh, okay. question, an, an issue, uh, the gender issue. That's, that's, uh, uh, this is really an ADHD thing. Uh, the question is, does ADHD uh, evoke um, gender issues in children like girls? climbing trees and developing as a sort of tomboy. You know the word tomboy, I don't know mm -hmm. if anyone understands the word tomboy, but it is a girl who looks a bit more like a boy, dresses more like a boy, doesn't have a gender in, in issue in the, in the sense of being to, uh, in transformation or something, but is more, more masculine. And do you uh, recognize any relation with ADHD and later on in, in sex mm -hmm. and for I mean, boys I, being more, uh, more female, the counterpart. You know, I don't see it on the, in the case of the guys, but I could see that for some girls who are more kind of hyperactive impulsive, that it doesn't, it doesn't go over as well with other girls. And they may find that they tend to have more male friends rather than female friends because guys will kind of, be more okay with that. They'll tolerate that better. It'll seem more kind of normal or whatever to them. So, you know, I could see it that way. And I would make a guess, I don't have data to back this up, but I would make a guess that some of these more kind of hyperactive impulsive women probably tend to be folks who have higher sex drives as well. That would be my guess. Yeah. So the, the, because gender is related uh, in, in my experience, uh, this tomboy type is an ADHD thing. It's not only, but mm -hmm. it appears more than ADHD. And from the tomboy side, you get your relation with the other sex, etc. So it can influence development, positive, but also negative. But it's not an, an issue that you meet a lot. It's not a thing I see a lot. I mean, I think it's just that if you think about kind of girly girl, you know, this is like all stereotype typical, but you know, hyperactive impulsive girls, I think tend to be a bit less girly girl. Um, and you know, or at least are not told, they're kind of told they're being less like a traditional girl. Um, you know, but whether that's good or bad, you know, it kind of depends on how they want to be, but, and how people react to it. But, but I think, uh, you know, I don't think this is a, a major thing for most people, but certainly I can see it might apply to some. Yeah, and uh, in all ADHD discussions, I like to bring up, hey, there, ADHD must be an advantage. L let's say evolutionary, it must be an advantage. That's why we are still here. Can you uh, elaborate about the advantages of F having ADHD in relations, including sexual relations? Because otherwise, we know there are a lot of problems mm -hmm. around sexuality and ADHD, but is there still a bit of advantage in it or is it only crying and terrible? <laughs> I mean, I think no. for any one person, you a know, a lot of advantages. Sorry, Ari, a lot <laughs> of advantages. A lot. Okay. I mean, I think well. we're all, we're all a mix of strengths and weaknesses. And, you know, sometimes also depending, you know, whether something is a strength or weakness depends the situation that you're in. If you're really funny, that could be a strength when you're hanging out with your friends. That may not be a strength in math class, at least as far as a teacher is concerned, right? Yeah. So, you know, so, okay. <laughs> or in bed, I don't know, might be, or not, depends if your partner is secure enough for themselves and has a sense of humor. But, yeah. um, but you know, sex should be fun and funny sometimes. Um, so, you know, I think that, you know, we talked about that greater sexual eagerness that folks with ADHD might have. And I think in long-term relationships, if the couple is doing well, 
and they continue to have sex and feel connected to each other, that, that can be a real strength. Because, yeah. you know, there's a, a danger in long-term relationships that the passion kind of fades away and you just become good friends who hopefully are good at like the business of running a house and raising kids. Yeah, and that's important. You know, like I don't want to shortchange that, but, but you lose that spark, that extra thing. Um, and if at least one of the people in the couple has a stronger sexual interest and is able to keep that aspect of the relationship a little more front and center, I think that can be a really good thing. So, um, you know, so again, it, it depends what you do with it. Yeah. Sure. Uh, okay. A new question came in, an, ex an extra question, uh, I think from Greece. Um, I, I get distracted, distracted on the new date and had a failure in sex, lost erection. That's a male problem when you lose concentration, etc. Okay. Right. Uh, I want to see the girl again, but I'm afraid it will happen again. What do I do? I think this refers to the possible extra anxiety that occurs yeah. in ADHD. The, the, uh, as a young boy, you will have learned you're a failure or, or you're wrong, and then also in your sexual life. So yeah. can you... Tell something about that, please. Yeah. So I think, first of all, the best way to not get an erection next time is to worry a lot about not getting an erection next time. Yeah. The more you worry about it, the worse it gets. Yeah, um, right. So my first bit of advice, and this is, this is important advice for all guys, especially for young guys, but actually also for older guys where it, for biological reasons, it's harder to get erections, um, is to not make sex all about erections. Like if you lose yes. your erection, that, you can leak. yes, you have other parts Just of your body. Your yeah. Just do it. There, yeah. Use, use your tongue, use your hand, switch to something else. And actually for most women, um, they're more reliably going to have an orgasm from something other than just intercourse yeah. that, you know, intercourse is really good at orgasms for men, but it's not as good at, at creating orgasms for women. So some other way of making sure that your partner has a good time makes it much more likely that this person is going to want to do something with you again. So stay calm. If you start focusing on your erection and it starts to go away, don't freak out in a mindful way. Shift your attention to some other aspect of what's going on. How sexy this person is, how this feels, how that feels. Shift, you know, position, do something different. Put yourself back into the moment and out of your head worrying about what's happening with your erection. Yeah, so here again, uh, uh, because of the, the chat we have, I, I, it, it came up today, I realized that it's so important to really talk about it and mention the problem when I lose my erection and the, someone telling you, okay, use another part of your body, yeah. you're not only your penis, so use something else. And, yeah. and it, makes, it makes it more relaxed when it's mentioned what's the problem and what are possible solutions and really clear and specific. So... Yeah. And to just say like, look, I, sometimes I get anxious and, you know, let's just do something else because yes. the pro, you know, the concern on, on is for the other person, whether they're a woman or a man is that they may start freaking out. Oh my God, I'm not hot enough or I'm not good enough. Or, you know, like they may worry that the lack of erection is because of them. And then they're, you're both freaking out and not enjoying the encounter. But, you know, this is part of the, like from a moral perspective, I don't care if people have hookup sex, like do what you want to do. As long as you're safe and respectful of others, yeah. I don't care. But yeah. the problem is that those first sexual encounters, as much as they're very exciting, can also be very anxiety provoking. And that can make it harder for the guy to keep it up and also make it harder if it's a, a woman involved to have an orgasm because she can't relax and, and really kind of be fully present sure. and focused on the experience. Sure. So, yeah. um, you know, so hookup sex is often not as good 
as sex that you, once you've been with someone a couple of times, especially if the hookup sex is occurring after you've been drinking too much, because nothing sexually works well after you've been drinking too much, like one drink, maybe two drinks, maybe. But once you get past that, probably the sexual encounter doesn't go as well. Yeah. Yeah, sure. So if you're impulsive about how much you're drinking on an anx anxious date, you may want to slow that down a little bit. Yeah. Oh, okay. but I, no, but uh, I would like to maybe in, in one minute hear um, emotions. So that is like the word that comes to me when talking about ADHD. And I had misunderstandings about it before because, you know, the, the emotions and the processing of the emotions um, with ADHD brain stays actually the same in adulthood. So uh, that can also be a certain obstacle or anxiety, but it can be like overstimulation or overthinking or getting overly excited, especially when it's their hyperactivity. So um, with sex and with intimacy, it's like a sleepy, sleepy territory. No? Any thoughts? Yeah. Yeah, no, I think you're right. Um, so, you know, that's one of these sort of, it could go either way, because on the one hand, mm -hmm. that being more emotional can make people with ADHD a lot of fun to hang out with, actually, mm -hmm. you yeah. know, because they feel their emotions more, they act on their emotions more. It's kind of like, hey, let's go do this thing. Um, okay, let's, yeah, let's go do that thing. Whether it's, let's go to this bar across town or, you know, you're you're kind of hot what if we go back to my place you know so that kind of impulsive um so it and yet at the same time if the emotions that you get caught up in are things like anger or frustration or impatience um that can definitely have a big effect on a date in a relationship on your sex life so yeah. you know so it's that thing of like really learning how to manage it how to rein it in but I think also for the non-ADHD partner to know when to not add fuel to the fire. Like don't mm, take yeah, it personally, yeah. let it go by, mm -hmm. manage your own emotions well. So yeah. then it, it, it sort of <laughs> goes by because if you react and they're reacting, then we're all reacting and then it yeah. just gets bigger and worse. Yeah, yeah. So, um, uh, I, I just looked back at your uh, article between the sheets, which mm -hmm. I would recommend to everybody who has a short attention span. Your article is three or four pages, so go ahead and read the article of uh, Adi Tuckman called ADAC Between the Sheets. And you mentioned there, uh, I, I really would like to hear something from you about that, the protective effect of good sex. Yeah, I know what you mean, but I want everybody to know it. <laughs> what, good yeah. sex? Sorry, I, I did. Um, the, the, what, pro, uh, good the, sex? Pro, the protective effect oh, of good okay. sex. Okay. But uh, how do you tell about it? Yeah, oh. that that I, you know, if a couple is doing well sexually, then when those standard things happen in life, I was supposed to pick up milk and I forgot to do it, or. I told you I would clean up the kitchen and I didn't, and I forgot and I didn't yeah. get there. Or, yeah. you know, I'm coming home from work, but I got distracted and I went and did something else and now I'm an hour late. Um, so, you know, that is normal stuff that happens in life. And hopefully we can work together to manage ADHD and there's maybe like less of that stuff that happens. I think that's a reasonable expectation. Um, yeah. But there's still going to be some of it. And if the couple is, is feeling connected and doing well with each other because of their good sex life, then when those things come up, they don't ruin the rest of the night. You know, it doesn't mean you're happy about it. You might still be like aggravating like, oh, you know, I really wish you would have cleaned the kitchen because like now I had to do it. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. You know what? You're right. I, that, that was my mistake. I should have. You're right. But I'll make it up to you. Right and now we're back on track. So the non-ADHD partner can bring up their concerns in an honest and direct way. The partner with ADHD can accept it and own it without getting angry or defensive. But also, of course, let's all be honest: like the non-ADHD partner is not perfect either. So you know that can also go back the other way. But that they can talk about stuff in a direct and honest way and then resolve it without it becoming yet another thing that pushes us apart. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Great. I, th I think this is, uh, if there are no other questions, this is a good 
closure. It's it's creating hope. But, uh, when you are in in your ADHD trouble at work, ADHD trouble in your relation, and then sex comes along, that when you start somewhere, sex will be better, and then from the better sex, your your relation can grow and develop. And yeah. I, I also think that the, the the positive side, well, we at least pointed it out that some people with ADHD can be more. Uh, from their impulsiveness come up with good ideas and at least have a fresh input like you told about if you have a long relationship long lasting relationship then you need every now and then some innovation yes <laughs> you need very happy to answer some questions by email or to write something up you can put in the newsletter yeah. or or we can do another one of these that's an option yeah. as well Okay, because uh, here's a boy and he sent three questions and he asked pretty, pretty please to help him because uh, apparently, you know, his situation, he's taking seriously his situation as he should. Good, yeah. good. So I will write him that he will get his opportunity to, to get the answer, right? Yeah, and the best is to send the email to me and I will pass it on to the experts. Okay. Well, um... A very big thank you to Ari Tuckman because uh, it was very exciting for us. Uh, it was our first webinar. Then I also had to manage a very uh, distracting uh, uh, sidekick. <laughs> so, but we, we are still alive. So again, thank you very much Ari Tuckman on behalf of the board of ADHD Europe. And we will have an evaluation, etc., and share it with you. Thank you again, and thank you for offering. Maybe sometime we do this again when we have collected some extra questions. And I think it was very informative. Saw that in the chat as well as in the Q and A. So, anything to close from your side, Ari? You know, I think what I would say is, I mean, first of all, obviously, thanks to both of you guys for for making this as fun as you did and for having me out. Um, I think it's a really important topic and. I think it's as much as sex is often a neglected topic when we talk about relationships in general, it has been almost completely neglected in the world of ADHD and how it affects a couple. Yeah. And it is so important and we're really missing out on an important way to make people's lives better by not specifically addressing this part of relationships. So yeah. um, I'm glad that you guys made it available. I hope some people buy my book. I won't you hardly make money writing books, but I think it's, you know, it's a fun thing to do. And I think there's some good information in there. Information, yes. And uh, now that we did this, I can tell you, I've look, been looking at which countries are participating, a lot of members of ADHD Europe. So for, as from now, sexuality and ADHD is all over the place in Europe. So don't awesome. worry about that. It will even be at our AGM, our general uh, yearly meeting is in April. And we will sure be talking about you and this subject and the fun we had. So thank you very Excellent. much.